This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 613, and we welcome Wynn White, a professional engineer, going to talk to us about some lessons learned on managing remediation and restoration down in Cajun country, and actually when does work all around the country as well. Before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. They are the reason that IAQ Radio is still here. Please tell our sponsors thank you for their support of IAQ Radio Plus. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute at CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association at IAQA.org, the Restoration Industry Association at RestorationIndustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. And Healthy Buildings America 2021 at HB2021-America.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions at graywolfsensing.com, TSI Inc. at tsi.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Dr. Pat Gaffaro, Chesterfield, Virginia who was first to identify the father of modern vaccines, Dr. Maurice Hilleman, who would have been 100 years old on August 30th, 2019. To this day, his work is estimated to have saved more lives worldwide than any other medical scientist in the 20th century. The IEQ radio trivia question for today, Friday, January 22nd, 2021, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here is today's trivia question. When and where was the first reference to a hurricane in what is now the United States? Back to you, Joe. All right, so Lynn White is with us today. Uh, his early work included a variety of civil engineering projects and included water, rust, water and wastewater subdivision layout and road projects. He later went on to become a licensed sewage treatment plant operator where he learned what really works and what doesn't for future projects. And wastewater brought him to Louisiana in 1980, the only person who ever admits he was carried south by sewage. Since then, Wynn has gone into uh, being the largest provider of asbestos inspection services in, in the state for school districts. He's also expanded into water damage restoration and mold remediation in the 2000 era, and he's a great building scientist. Welcome to IAQ Radio, Wynn. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. It's great to have you on, on the show. Um, you know, I started, we had kind of similar upbringing. I wasn't in the wastewater world, but I started in that asbestos world back in the 80s and uh, did some industrial hygiene type work. Um, how did you get sucked into the water damage and mold arena from doing asbestos work? That's a pretty good question. Basically, what happened was I was the asbestos guru in Louisiana and did a lot of indoor work because of the asbestos inside and I, and expert witness work as well. And I had attorneys calling me and asking me if we could sample for mold. 
And I really resisted it at first because uh, keep it simple, stupid. I said, well, can you see it? They would say, mm-hmm. yes. Can you smell it? They'd say, yes. I said, well, well why do you want a sample for it? You got mold. <laughs> uh, but anyway, they insisted and kept calling. And finally I gave in. I said, hey, if they'll pay me to tell them what they already know, I can do that. And uh, yeah. I decided I'd get the best education I could and uh, had to run that down uh, through the University of Tulsa. So uh, it's a long answer to a simple question, but that's basically how I did it. Well, and then you ended up going to Merck, the Mid-Atlantic Environmental Hygiene Resource Center and uh, hooking up with Joe Steebrook. And, and you've got a great background in building science as well, which I think is uh, really important when you're, you're dealing with mold and moisture issues. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about your work with school districts, because I, I, I know that that can be complicated and managing projects for large public buildings or school districts can also be very complicated. Um, what kind of tips would you give consultants and contractors that are, that are trying to get into that level of the business as opposed to maybe just doing some home inspections? Well, it's, it's pretty good leap from doing home inspections to doing, uh, uh, let's call it serious commercial work or large property holders, buildings, uh, doing multiple buildings simultaneously takes some horsepower and you better have your ducks in a row um, and, and a number of people and train people. So uh, that, that our biggest challenge is making sure our employees are up to speed. So when I send them out, we do what the client needs done, not what I think we want to do. So uh, my advice would be get the best education you can and um, start slow. And as far as calling on those folks, I would say use your existing clients, service them so well that they will give you referrals and educate them on what you do so that they'll hire you when an event like that happens in a crisis. And that's a good point because you work in residential properties. A lot of them, those folks have children in school or, you know, they may work in uh, larger public buildings. So do a really good job servicing them. And uh, that may lead to bigger and better things. I like that. Cliff, let me turn it over to you for a question. Uh, Thanks, thanks, Joe. Um, As you're located in a hurricane-prone zone, when the most of your clients pre-qualify restoration contractors and have the chosen firm selected and written into their disaster contingency plan in advance, you know, you would think uh, this this year was not, or last year was not the first uh, hurricane season we've ever gone through. Uh, but the short answer is many of them do not have a disaster recovery plan. And um, when, when I'm speaking and training on mold, for example, uh, I, I preach about why not go ahead and get bids for next year's hurricane season from contractors. So, yeah, you'd want to pre-qualify those folks and, and get bids from them. But I, I would want to know that when I, the next hurricane, I don't want to be thinking about, well, who am I going to call? I want to know we're ready to go. And uh, it'd be simple to do, cost you some money to get up to that point. But why not? Well, let me say it this way. Don't rely on your insurance company or the adjusters to help you out. They're going to refer you to people that they like to deal with. I want somebody who's got my best interest at heart or my client's best interest right. to heart. You know, when th- these projects take a lot of money and um, that money can come from different sources. And especially when it's a catastrophic loss, uh, money can come. You know, I remember when we did big school projects, we would always tell people to get your work in, get it done and get it built, and don't be last because the last guy oftentimes got stuck trying to get their money. Right, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> how long does it typically take on your projects and where does the money come from? Well, it varies all over the map. You know, uh, the short answer is it can come from cash if they have the wherewithal on hand, insurance companies, and then FEMA. 
And if you're relying on FEMA reimbursement for your payment, you're, you're in the finance business, whether you know it or not. Because, uh, for example, uh, Hurricane Laura, Laura was at the last part of August. And here we are in January. And I know folks who have not been paid for uh, the work that they've done. And, you know, it, it depends on the job. But if your burn rate's a million dollars a day, it doesn't take too long to run up quite a, quite a tab. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, who, who wants to finance $70 million? Yeah. Who can finance 70 million? Right, right, right. <laughs> but that's what you end up doing because, they, for example, in our case, our vendors, they want, you think if I tell them, hey, we're not going to pay you until we get paid and we're eight months down the road, they're not going to be happy campers, are they? Right. You know, I, I learned a lesson when I was down there doing some consulting work for FEMA. I didn't realize that religious institutions did not, receive federal assistance money, I guess, from FEMA. What do those folks do? Oh, that's tough. You, you know, and, and you've got insurance and you've got cash. And if, and, and we did do some uh, church work, mm -hmm. uh, but our agreement is with the owner, the church. And, and we, we're pretty clear and we use the, uh, EJCDC contract documents, engineering agreements. And, and we tell them, you know, look, we bill every 30 days and we expect to be paid every 30 days. And if, if that's not gonna work for you, then we're probably not a good fit uh, for your project. Now that, that's on new clients. You know, if, if a, an existing client calls me and says, when I want you here tomorrow, we're going without a contract even. Right, right, understood. What about, <clears throat> excuse me, um, protecting your, your clients from fly-by-night contractors, price gouging? What kind of tips would you give people for protecting their clients from those types of things? What we do is we bid all of our construction or restoration work. And uh, if it's a public project here in Louisiana anyway, if it's over... Uh, I want to say now they've raised it to $75,000 worth of work. You have to advertise it. Now, if it's an emergency, as in a crisis after a storm, that's rate, the limits are raised. But we advertise. And if it's not something where we're advertising, there are four contractors here in the state who do a lot of our work just getting it by bidding. We will call them and get them to bid the job. So we get bids to do the work even after a crisis. And the, the fact is, if you go to Lake Charles where we're real heavily involved over there recovering right now, first off, finding a place to stay, finding employees, you know, people are trying to get their hat back in their house. Uh, sometimes they don't worry about going to work too much. And um, so you got to uh, work with the community and no, when we get bids on a project in that situation, the prices are going to be higher than if we bid it today for next year's storm season. Mm -hmm. So I, these, that's what we preach. Bid the work today because I know we'll have a storm, maybe not next year or the next year, but it'll come. Um, are, are these projects prevailing wage? That's a great question. It depends. Um, and we haven't been asked that. I, I know in the past, and I'm trying to think after we had a flood here in the uh, Baton Rouge area in 2016. And I seem to remember, and Chris White handles all that kind of stuff for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think we did some prevailing wage audits for the contractors on some of those jobs. So I think, you know, when federal money's involved, yeah. That does uh, come around. Yeah, most. I guess is, is a, Go ahead. Uh, I guess as a follow up, you just mentioned audits uh, on a lot of these projects that, that are quite large. Do you put in a clerk of the works, or does the insurance company send in a clerk of the works, or you know someone like that to monitor, you know, and, and count uh, how many staff and products are being used and 
pieces of equipment and so on and so forth? Yeah, we don't do that kind of work, but I do know that the, uh, for example, school systems, they'll have a, uh, in, in the, the firm I'm most familiar with, they're a big engineering uh, architectural firm, and they'll do much of that work. Uh, but some don't. And it takes forever to get FEMA reimbursement if you don't follow, you know, follow all their uh, PWs and, and do all that right. You, you could be out of luck when it comes time to get paid. Right, right. Absolutely. And that's the, the building owner's responsibility win or, or does, how does that work with FEMA? I'm not that familiar with working with FEMA. Yeah, it's the building owners um, that are responsible for all that. And so, I mean, you, it's an unbelievable amount of paperwork. And I recommend, and of course, today it, it, it's, it's easier to do. Back, um, oh, 15 years ago, we, after a storm, we had one school system that, you know, everything wasn't electronic or digital back then. And FEMA, and Cliff, maybe you were in this role when you, helping FEMA, but they, you, they would change people. Like it seemed like every other month you had another uh, agent to talk to. And so I ended up and ours was digital. We would send the same stuff, you know, a dozen times. Um, Cause it was like nobody at FEMA was talking to another person at FEMA mm -hmm. or the handoff. Uh, so keep it digital and just be prepared to submit the same stuff over and over and over again. You know, we got a uh, text from Chris White uh, listening remotely. He said that some projects are Davis-Bacon, especially if FEMA is heavily involved. And in Louisiana, the construction cost threshold for advertising has been raised to 250000 So if less than that, the owner doesn't have to advertise the project, but we always recommend getting competitive proposals or bids. So uh, Chris helped out with that one. So yeah, really now you know it. who does all the work here, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I understand, believe me. I got one of those guys myself. Uh, my son does a lot of the work as well. But anyway, uh, when you do bid projects, um, do you require like uh, a lump sum bid or do you have a lump sum plus time of materials cost, uh, labor costs? How do, you, how do you recommend people handle that? Well, it, it depends. If, if I were bidding a job for next year, then I would do it on a unit price bid or there'd be a bid schedule. And uh, some clients, so, and we, we did some bids this year that were lump sum after the fact. You know, we needed numbers. We would do a pre-bid walkthrough, walk through the contractors and say, here's the job. And just point it out. Yeah, we did a set of plans. We did a set of technical specifications and then we got the bids. But I, I like the idea of using a unit price uh, or a bid schedule. And that way you get, you know, 10,000 square feet of gypsum board at X dollars a foot. That way, if it runs over or under, you can adjust the contract and it was based on a bid. The trick, and here's the caution, you need to do a good job estimating what you think the quantities are going to be. Uh, don't, I've seen some people who would say, okay, well, I want, give me a price per square foot for jip board, a price per square foot for floor tile, a price per square foot for ceiling tile. And then they would add those unit prices up and award based on that total number. Well, that is absolutely crazy because if you get a sophisticated contractor, they will imbalance or unbalance their bids so that if they know you're going to get more jip board than ceiling tile, they'll lower one number and raise the other and basically uh, take advantage of the client. That's not the word I wanted to use, but that was. Right. Uh, well, I right, mean, it's, right. it's and so we do. World. And so now our job, we have to do a good, good job on estimating what the quantities are. So you'd say, well, how do you do that? Well, you could do say, look, this is like on a typical building. Let's say you only, let's say you have a tornado hit a school. All right. You can know, you can guesstimate about how much damage you're going to have there. So you could have those unit prices, have the contractor multiplied out, 
add them up and you've got a number you can compare based on price. If it's in a flood zone, a little bit different, you know you're gonna do, yeah, first off, it's not probably not the first time the building's flooded. So you, shoot, just go get the quantities from the last time it flooded and mm. uh, use those and get a bid and, and you're off to the races. And, and it's fair to the contractors too. You know, one thing I found back when I was doing those types of projects is that contract, because it's very competitive. You have, you know, sometimes you have 10, 12 contractors walking a, a large project at a school. So they're all looking for, or many of them anyway, are looking for things that you as the consultant missed in your scope of work sure. so that they can come in with a low, you know, let's say it's a lump sum price, but then they can make their money on the extras. Uh, what do you reckon? Do you see that still? Um, do you see it on mold remediation type projects, water damage projects? And how do you suggest consultants stop that kind of thing? Well, the, the consultants got to be, have some experience and uh, listen, we're not perfect. So uh, uh, I'm not implying that, but you, you need to take a look. What are the uh, hidden things or the possibilities? Now, I don't have x-ray vision. So, you know, once you open a wall up, uh, sometimes you find stuff that you really wish you hadn't found, but it, it leads to an extra. So unforeseen site conditions. I mean, we have in our contract documents, we have clauses that cover un unforeseen site conditions and the contractors do additional compensation. Uh, that's the long and the short of it. When okay. for um, restoration contractors that provide the emergency services. I guess if you got a rate sheet from them, you would want to know, you know, what they're charging, I guess, rental rates uh, for different types of equipment and yeah. what they would be charging for, um, you know, excess labor for doing muck out and, and stuff like that. Yeah, you would want that. And so, you know, I mentioned bid, if we were bidding it on a lump sum basis, uh, before we start work or the contractors start work, we would have them give us a um, schedule of pricing so that when we run into that, we would, we would have that. But we wouldn't bid the work on that basis. I, I think that would be a good pre-qualification question uh, before you get to the bid. Mm -hmm. When you've, you've worked a lot with both asbestos projects and, and then mold projects and water damage restoration projects, I wonder, uh, do you find asbestos companies are, are also good at mold remediation and or water damage restoration, or is that something you got to be a little careful about? Right. Like anything, you got to be careful because many jobs end up, you know, how good is the superintendent uh, or the supervision out on the particular job? But our experience has been, at least here in Louisiana, the contractors, uh, they do their homework. Uh, let's say you're a great asbestos uh, contractor and really you know, controlling dust and all that, there's not much difference between controlling the dust from an asbestos job and a mold project. Um, they do their homework. Uh, the, you know, for sure, those contractors who bid in our projects, they know what we expect. And so they've gotten their, their stuff together so that they can do and and meet our requirements and give our client a good job so they do good work that doesn't mean sometimes we don't have to raise a little sand but uh that happens on every job or could well i think setting the expectations is, a, is another important thing for consultants to do they've got to set the right expectation we expect this when you are done uh that doesn't always happen uh, good point. I mean, you've got to have a good scope and, and it's fair to the contractor to know what they're bidding on. Uh, you don't want to be changing things after the fact, uh, you know, give me a price for a, a car and you, you, you're thinking Volkswagen and he's thinking Cadillac or vice versa. It's uh, easy to get wound up. Well, I think you brought up another really important point and that is who is the superintendent or project manager going to be on that project. Is there a way you, uh, I know you work with a lot of the similar contractors and, and you probably expect that they will put, you know, one of their better guys on there, but is there a way to ensure that 
the person who's the best project manager or superintendent for that job is on that job? Oh uh, gosh, that's a good question. And I don't know. I, I know uh, so many times we know the people who are going to be out there. And, um, and again, we, it ain't our first rodeo and it's not theirs either. And so they know who they really should be putting on our, our projects. And, um, I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for the question, Joe. Uh, I understand. It's all right. We don't have to have one for every question. <laughs> I just think it's a good uh, thing for people to think about prior to a project. Are you, how are you going to ensure that the guy you expect to be on that project is on that project? So it's just yeah, something you, you can about. ask for. But I know in our case, let's let's take uh, let's say you have and we have parishes, not counties. But so you've got a countywide school system that every school has been uh, damaged in some way. You're gonna have 60 different uh, project supervisors because you have 60 different sites. Uh, there's no way you're even gonna meet all those folks until you get out on the job. Yeah, well, good point. And it doesn't take very long to figure out whether they know what they're doing or not, too. Yeah. When I got a text question here from a listener, I think it's a good question. What about lead paint? um and lead paint contractors i assume you get mixed up in the lead paint issue because you, you know you've done asbestos you're doing mold obviously you're going to disturb paint thoughts on lead paint contractors and and how how well they could possibly do some of this work well i think and here in louisiana you have to be a licensed contractor to, to do that work same thing on asbestos it, it's a specialty uh, attached to your general contractor's license We've had good luck with them. And so it, 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 let me tie into that question with, you know, before you start work, you need to check the building for asbestos. You need to check for lead paint. You need to check for mercury. You need to check for, for PCBs. I mean, there are other environmental issues besides mold, uh, often, at least in older facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, make sure the building's safe where you go in it. Uh, you know, if uh, I've got one that the power is is on, all right? Well, you go in there and start ripping the uh, ceiling grid out. First thing you know, you got wires, so you might have a uh, little bit of an issue with some power. So lockout, tag out gets to be an important deal. Uh, yeah, I know that's not environmental, but it is safety related. Absolutely. Cliff, you want to get one more? I'm go sorry. Ahead. Um, I'll tell you what, no, Joe, I, but I but I would like to start the second half with a three part question. So if you got a short one, go ahead. Uh, you know what? I don't. Let's go into halftime, and then when we come back, we'll talk a little more with Mr. Win White. We're we're talking about managing uh, restoration remediation projects, and uh, look forward to the second half, John. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology, unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, at AIHA.org. ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, interested in defining their science at acgih.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research at ciriscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association, promoting the exchange of indoor environmental quality information through education and research at iaqa.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry, network with leaders at restorationindustry.org. The Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at iicrc.org. And Healthy Buildings America 2021 in Honolulu, Hawaii, August 10 through 12, 2021 at hb 2021 hyphen america.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, free shipping, great pricing, same day results with no rush fee at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, 
feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation, count on us at particlesplus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, over 20 years manufacturing accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable short term and continuous monitoring at graywolfsensing.com. TSI Inc an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers at HealthyIndoors.com. All right, we're back with the second half of our interview. We've got Wynn White from down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Cliff, why don't you take the next question? Uh, thanks, Joe. Okay, Wynn, I've got a three-part question for you, and it's really about mistakes. Can you give us examples of a costly mistake made by a consultant, one by a contractor, and one by a client on a large loss? I uh, think for the... Uh... And you'll have to remind me, I, I'm, I'm 69, so I may forget what all three were. But, uh, <laughs> you know, as far as clients go, I think one of the biggest mistakes is trying to do a bid just based on here's the unit price schedule and just adding those up without quantities listed. Mm -hmm. You end up with, a, I'll call it a bogus number that really doesn't help anything. So um, the biggest mistake is not having your contractors lined up before the event in that case. Uh, contractors, um, and I apologize for the contractors online, I'll probably offend some of y'all is, uh, you know, just because a building has been through a hurricane and let's say lost a roof, portion of the roof, doesn't mean you need to replace all the ceiling tile in the place. And we've seen some contractors who, you know, they're based, they're getting paid by the uh, square foot and so the more square feet they uh, remove, the, the more revenue they generate. Um, so that's, that's the biggest mistake. And it leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And they paint us all with the same brush you know, because we're all in the, in the boat trying to, to resolve these issues. And then uh, for consultants, um, I'll tell you what, when you have particularly a large project, getting the people, your staff in there with the right equipment to do the moisture measurements and assess what needs to be done. You need to have people who know what they're doing to do that. And even if you, I, I'm a big fan of Tramex moisture meters. Right, absolutely. You know, and you, and you get, uh, and different editions uh, have different scales on them and you know you've got a wood scale you could have one for concrete you, and you've got most of them have a relative or a reference scale on it i've seen where um, some consultants will put a piece of tape on the wall where they measured the moisture in the wall and you get numbers like 50 and and i'm thinking you know 50 what it, it's and they're saying, we've well, got to tear this jip board out. And you can look at it and see that it never got wet. Uh, you know, it, uh, it was painted as, as uh, you know, it, it drives me wild. We had one consultant who, uh, do you know what terraza floor is? Absolutely. It's, sure. it, it's a concrete type product. Mm -hmm. They were showing it was wet and needed to remove the terraza floor. Uh, so you need to get your consultant and all their people need to know how to use the equipment that, that you're trying to use. It was good equipment. They just didn't know how to use it. How to use it. So um, that, that's the biggest thing you need to avoid as, as a consultant. Uh, maybe not the biggest, but it, it sure looms pretty big in my mind. Thank you, Joe. During, you know, when you have these major hurricanes and so forth, uh, the local contractors, as I understand, just can't do all the work. So you're going to have contractors coming in from around the country. What kind of tips would you give contractors that are coming into Louisiana to help respond to hurricane related water damage? Uh, well, the first thing, and again, I apologize to all those folks. Uh, just because you come from north of the Mason Dixon line doesn't mean we're all stupid here in uh, 
Louisiana, you know, treat us <laughs> like we're part of the United States. But um, my tip would be, and, and this works too for the local contractors, is you need to team up with your uh, friendly competitors who are competent so that you can put enough people and equipment in these facilities to get them dry. So for the national firms, and they do it for the most part, they will team with local folks uh, to get it done. I mean, you need uh, manpower. And um, I'll tell you another thing we see, we see a lot of temp services that uh, almost the people are trained to the level of they're in the parking lot at Home Depot this morning when I picked them up to, uh, to go do the work. You know, no safety training, um, may not even uh, speak English uh, as far as that goes. So you, you, you need, you know, this is America. We need to all communicate and do the right thing. And, and uh, in a crisis mode, don't take advantage of us. How about that? There you go. When, when I don't know, is um, Louisiana enforcing their mold licensing requirements? I know they had at one point, and I don't know whether after the hurricanes, because there was just so much work, uh, whether they're enforcing that or not. I would guess they're enforcing it. If here in Louisiana, if you do a dollar's worth of mold remediation work or more, you have to be a licensed mold contractor. So, okay. uh, and there'll be some folks who don't do that. And cause you see in the, uh, in the news where people there, there's, there's some fraud out there. Absolutely. And is it just the, the, contractors or, or a supervisor that has to have that license uh do the workers themselves have to show any type of training for the state law uh, the state law it's just the contractor um, the firm itself has to have a uh, mold license and of course they have a responsible party so there is a person associated with that but they don't have to be on the site mm. Okay. What about consultants? Uh, as, as I recall, you don't have any requirements for consultants at this point. Correct. Yeah. If you can spell mold, you, uh, you can be a mold consultant uh, here okay. in Louisiana. Okay. I don't mean to demean all the consultants, but uh, there's no okay. licensing requirement. And yeah, you know, I've had, I've been asked a million times, do you have a, uh, and I'm going to make these up, but a CME, a CIE, a ABC, one, two, three. And I said, well, look, I've got P E after my name, you know, and engineers as a professional, my job is to help protect the public's health, welfare, and safety. That says it all. If you, if you ask me, so no, I don't have any of those designations. Uh, uh, that's why I went to the Merck school. I got the best of the best from the best, uh, including a guy, you know, real well too. So, uh, uh Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Um, I, I guess, you know, one of the questions is, you know, we recently had Claudette Hanks Reichel on the show. And, um, one of the things that we talked about with her was in Louisiana building back after floods and catastrophic water damage, you know, following the catastrophic water losses, uh, that, that your clients have. Are they doing anything to build back better, you know, using more water resistant materials or, or anything like that, that, you know, many of them do, but sometimes it gets back to, you know, for example, FEMA, if it's an improvement, you may have some difficulty in getting the uh, reimbursement for that work. So if you don't have the uh, financial wherewithal, you're just not going to do it. So they'll go back with replacement in kind, but it's, uh, you know, water resistant gyp board. Uh, right. I'm a big fan of it. If you flood, you're crazy if you go back with paper face gyp board. Um, same Will thing. They pay for that? Pardon? Will they pay for the water resistant gyp board or, or, or not? That I don't know. You're talking about FEMA? Yeah. 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 yeah I don't know. You would think of uh, insurance companies too. You'd have to look into that. You would think they would want that because they may be back in six months or a year replacing that same drywall again, but yeah. Reducing their loss. Uh, I, you know, I, I have mixed motions about insurance companies and, 
I, I advise my clients that, you know what, whose interest does the insurance company have in mind on your job? Right. It's theirs. So, uh, um, you know, and I tell you what, some of our clients, you know, let's say uh, I'm making this up, so I'm not talking about any one client, but let's say you have $20 million worth of coverage. That's a lot of insurance coverage, isn't it? But if your loss is $40 million, uh, let's do the math. You know, that means I'm $20 million short. Um, it, it's incumbent upon you as the client to pick your contractors well and your consultants well and bird dog, both the consultant and the contractor, as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. Keep, you know, minimize your loss if you can. Got a... Uh... A text actually from Chris. Sometimes there's a systemic breakdown in setting the scope and it can result in unnecessary work that gets done. Do you have maybe an example that you could give us on what I've he's talking about? I've got a perfect example. And, and I kind of touched on it earlier is, okay, you got a building. Uh, it may not have even had any damage, but it was, in, you know, it was there during the hurricane. All right. You go in and the ceiling tile are basically pristine. There aren't even any water stains in it. And the first, it was one of the first buildings we walked in. I go in and the contractor's steady busting or lifting this and destroying the ceiling tile. And I said, whoa, you got to stop. You know, just uh, don't remove all ceiling tile do remove all damaged and wet ceiling tile or ceiling tile exhibiting the signs of mold growth, but that doesn't mean remove all ceiling tile. Um, and, and so sometimes our job is, is as big on throttling the contractor back as it is, uh, right, of course we had, a, our scope says, remove no undamaged material without owner's prior approval. How about that? That's a good point. Yep. Absolutely. Cliff, you want me to jump in here or are you good? Yeah, you can't, Joe. I was writing. All right. I got a building science. Um, I want to go into the building science a little bit more, When I know that you have looked at building science very, you know, you, you've studied building science for years. You're a PE. I'm wondering what, what fundamental building science concepts seem to be the hardest for people to get, you know, to take seriously. When, when you talk to building owners and managers, what, what do they just have a real hard time with, with, um, you know, with, with, with recognizing as a building science concept? Well, I to, and I, I guess it's probably a two or three parter. Number one is, you know, and, and it rains here just like it does in the rest of the country. Of course, sometimes it rains horizontally here, but uh, is, you know, you got a cladding system. The building enclosure has a cladding and then you have your uh, weather resistant barriers underneath. The cladding's main mission is to shed the bulk rainwater off of it. And uh, the best example I can give you is if you take brick, a brick veneer, and just take a garden hose and uh, mist water on it, in about a minute or less, you'll have free water running down the backside of the brick. People say, oh, no, no, that's impossible. I said, no, 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 that's what it's supposed to do. And because it's supposed to get through there, go down to the bottom, hit the flashing, and come out the weep holes. Of course, it's running, it may get back to the uh, weather resistant barrier, whether it's felt or one of the uh, sheet products that's uh, manufactured. But if you do that and do it, and oh, wait a minute, we, if you built the perfectly good wall, the first thing we do is punch holes in it. We call them windows and doors. And, you know, Larry, the cable guy shows up and drills a hole through your wall. You need to uh, flash those uh, and seal those openings so that water doesn't get past the uh, weather resistant barrier and the walls will work. And that also includes stucco or aluminum siding or wood siding. Uh, think, think belts and suspenders. And then the other issue is air, uh, HVAC. The V is ventilation, all right? In, uh, when you're in a cooling season, what's that? When the air conditioner's running, you should have more air blown into the building than you're sucking out of it with the exhaust 
uh, fans so that you're under slight positive pressure so that, uh, oh, that V air, I want to dry it. Yeah, I want to temper it or cool it or heat it. But anyway, I want dry air leaking out of my wall rather than moist air leaking in it. And then control the dew point. Uh, we recommend a 53 degree dew point inside. It'll reduce your uh, chances for uh, condensation. Uh, nothing's perfect. Uh, doesn't always work, but you know what? If you do those three things, you're gonna go a long way towards uh, reducing your problems with moisture and mold. Have you had trouble getting people to adjust to the idea of measuring dew point as opposed to relative humidity? Yeah, and a lot of confusion. And I tell you, there's some engineers even, you, you mentioned that and they said, well, well, wait a minute, it costs too much money to do that. Or that's not the way we design the equipment for the building. And I say, well, you know, you're gonna keep having trouble if you don't give the client something to control these problems because moisture ain't going away. Um, and when you mentioned drying your ventilation air. I think that's an excellent point, uh, especially in a climate like yours where you're in a hot, humid climate. But I think just about anywhere, we should be cautious about making sure we dry that extra, that ventilation air. So when you're bringing air into the building, it's, it's dry. Are you seeing more building owners using separate dehumidification uh, or pre-dehumidifying air prior to it going to their mechanical system? Yes, it's in, in our part of the world. And here's the other thing. So you're, if you're running the building at partial load, how in the world are you gonna get the main air conditioning, which is generally set for cooling. And it, it's not measuring uh, relative humidity or dew points, it's, only it's running off the thermostat, you know, which is uh, the sensible load. So you need something else, and that's called additional equipment to control that dew point temperature. And yes, it costs money. Um, it, I'm the Fram oil filter man. Pay me now or pay me later. Uh, which <laughs> way do you want it? I understand. I, I mean, and then you'll get the old. Uh but buildings need to breathe when, you know, uh, how do you, how do you, how do you educate people about the fact that, yeah, they need to breathe, but the right way. Yeah. Well, I say, again, I said the V is ventilation, but I say, you know, and I hear it a kind of a different way is we're just building our buildings too doggone tight. And that's what's causing the, uh, all the mold problems. And I said, well, look, I know how to fix that. Let's just use shoddy construction. Let's leave, uh, you know, how many windows do you want to leave out? See, we'll save money because we won't have to put windows in and we'll just make this thing as leaky as you want it. Um, yeah, then it can breathe. So you need to think about breathing in a different way and, uh, and then don't ever bring out vapor or they'll go crazy. You know, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Vapor barriers tend to be, uh, forbid. I, I try to stay away from that topic because, uh, it can be tough enough to get people to understand things like humidity versus dew point. I've got a text question. Uh, dew point sensors versus measurement of relative humidity, which is preferable? Well, you have to measure the relative humidity and the temperature to get the dew point. So I'm not sure exactly uh, the nature of the question. You got to, you have to measure the temperature and the relative humidity and that gives you dew point. Yep. Okay. I, I think the that. question I think the question was related to sensors. Is there a such thing as a dew point sensor that could be installed? Sure. Okay. Yeah. That's a long so answer, just, isn't it? So then <laughs> I think that, so then I think your your uh the, the answer would be uh dew point sensor would be preferable over a relative humidity sensor. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean just measuring relative humidity does nothing for you, really. Yeah, we, you, you know, you want to, in the literature, you want to stay under 70%, but, um, you know, doggone it, uh, let, let's take doing a floor or you're recoding a floor, you're going to put a uh, mastic down for floor tile, let's say. If you 
don't have the dew point temperature of the slab uh, closer than 10 degrees to the dew point mixture of the air mixture above it, you're going to have moisture problems on your new floor. You know, it's just not going to work. And so just measuring the relative humidity in that situation doesn't tell you anything, doesn't help you. Very good. All right, let's go to the roundup, John. When I, you know, this, this whole conversation leads me uh, to a, another issue that I am sure you run into. And some of my friends down at the Greenville School District in Greenville, South Carolina, go crazy because people want to blame their flooring related moisture issues on moisture coming up through the slab. And sometimes that does happen, but in my experience, a lot less often than problems with dew point at the slab, which you just talked about. Can you emphasize a little further? How often yeah, do you I, actually find it coming up through the slab versus it being a dew point issue at the slab? Well, in, in our part of the world, you know, you, you don't have to... Uh, dig much of a hole to have a swimming pool. So if you're a slab at grade, even if you put a good, good vapor barrier underneath the concrete and it has to be in direct contact with the concrete, uh, you don't want to layer sand or aggregate between the uh, concrete and the uh, vapor barrier. But you know, there's an edge of a slab, uh, you know, at, at the building edge. You need to keep water away from that edge or concrete's a hard sponge. It'll suck water right through the slab on into the building. So my caution there is, um, you know, paint the edge of the slab with latex paint. But uh, uh, the other thing is uh, water cement ratio when they pour the slab, you know, 48% uh, water cement ratio, which is a stiff mix, that'll reduce your problems. But you said it, Joe, shoot. If you, you can have a great dry slab, but when you do the uh, floor covering, if the dew point temperatures are out of whack, it, it's not gonna work. So uh, you have to get it within 10 degrees or you're, it just, you're, you're headed for disaster. I think that's a good point for people to keep in mind. And you say within 10 degrees. Can, can you give us a, a little more concrete example so that you know you're, you're looking at the the 10 degree difference between the air and the slab dew point you you measure the uh temperature of the slab I, yeah. I'll, I'll make it real simple measure the temperature of the slab and measure the temperature of the air mix in the space all right so now uh it's got to be within in fact, I want to be less than 10 degrees to, to be careful. So how do you reach that? Well, the answer is you may have to dehumidify the air in the building when you're, you're doing the work. The air conditioner, you know, air conditioners do remove some moisture, but they're not dehumidifiers. So uh, you need fans to move the air. You probably need a dehumidifier. And don't forget some of these products these adhesives are now water-based. Oh, gee, do, do you think that'll affect the uh, uh, dew point temperature of the air mix above it? You betcha. Yeah. So uh, get it down less than, than 10 degrees difference. Very good. Cliff? Well, I, I had more of a comment than a question. You know, it's, uh, you know, I think the United States, we love our Cajuns and they are Canada's loss because they were kind of kicked out of Canada and they went down <laughs> to Louisiana and we've loved them ever since. So <laughs> that's my comment. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, let me let me do this. Um, we did, like I said, we, like Cliff mentioned, we had Claudette and Hanks Reichel on the show, and, and you're close to La House, and you know Claudette pretty well. What important building science concepts uh, does La House model that others in your area and around the country could learn from? And I know there's probably a, a lot of them, but maybe you could pick one or two of the most important. 
I'm not sure I could pick one or two. I mean, the house has different construction. Uh, so it's not all one way or another. I mean, different siding, uh, different slab, insect protection, uh, air handling system. Uh, she put together a uh, panel of experts to help on the design of this thing. And, and again, you know, the biggest contributor to that. Uh, and uh, it's good for a hot, humid climate. And a lot of the stuff will work anywhere in the lower 48 states. I encourage you to go to, and I don't get paid for this, uh, you go to LSU's website and look up La House, L-A-H-O-U-S-E. And uh, uh, there are a lot of free information there that'll be helpful to anybody. Yeah, they've got some some tremendous information on that website. It's it's a great program, and uh, we really uh, appreciate. It. I, I were you part of helping them down there with the development of the little house? Yes, we were lucky enough to be invited to be part of that team, and so we did contribute uh, uh, some engineering work. Great stuff down there. Really, really, really important, uh, I think, for people to know about. Um, Cliff, any final thoughts before we go? I'm good, Joe. Thanks. I just want to have one final uh, chance to, to ask. First, thank you for joining us, Wynn. And second, is there anything that we, we missed that you'd like to kind of talk a little bit more about? I, I don't think you missed it, but it was a good question when you were asking about the lead paint and all that. Please, you know, after a, a disaster, whether it's a tornado or a flood or a hurricane, safety is number one. And, uh, you know, if the structure's damaged, you need to be careful. You know, if, if there's power, gas, uh, in our part of the world, there's some critters that are big enough that'll cause you some problems. So uh, pay attention. Uh, and, That's a uh, very good point. <laughs> do good to... work. How about that? Do the right thing do the right thing, do good work and um, communicate properly too. I think oh, when, when people are managing projects, oftentimes the, the communication is the, the downfall of the project. I agree completely. All right. Well, Mr. Wynn White, we appreciate having you on uh, and, and always look forward to seeing you at summer camp here real soon. Um, this is Radio Joe Hughes saying thanks to Wynn White, uh, our professional engineer, for some tips from Cajun country. Very much appreciated. I want to thank our sponsors, as always, the, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. At the controls, John, you got to have faith. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. By the way, we've got uh, Bud Offerman joining us next week. Uh, Bud's been a little concerned about some of the methods people were using for uh, protection from COVID-19, some of the products being sold. So we're going to bring Bud in. We're going to talk a lot about ventilation issues and, and things that are going on currently with um, some of the things being sold for COVID, uh, especially when the, those, those things related to mechanical systems. So looking forward to that when we come back next Friday at noon with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening.